Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. Yes, it's time for another Gardening Simplified show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. We're broadcasting from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. Container gardens have personality. They reflect your personality. And Stacy, I like to think you can create chaos with control limited by the boundaries of the pot. I experienced that last year with truffula pink gomfrina, which just went nutsy cuckoo. And uh, but fortunately, the boundaries of the pot was there. Well, you know, I think a, an annual going nutsy cuckoo is exactly what it is programmed and supposed to do yes. for you. I mean, if an annual is not going nutsy cuckoo, kind of a boring summer. True. Yeah. <laughs> and we like some excitement. So there's so many benefits to container gardening from being able to grow plants in small spaces to be able to move your garden to sun or shade conditions contingent on what you're planting. And then, of course, you've got to remember that the plants you put in the container are going to have to coexist in that same container. So you want plants with similar needs. Uh, but, Stacy, container gardening is just perfect for gardeners and folks who want to experiment with different plant combinations, textures, and colors. You know, it's so true. And it really – so you and I are – um, on the older side, we've been around for a while, been gardening for many years. I'm much and, older than you. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> but still, like, do you remember when uh, containers basically meant uh, one of those swan planters or those oh. black cauldrons? Uh, those plastic black, black cauldrons. cauldrons. Yes. <laughs> My mom had those. And whiskey barrels. Let, let us not forget whiskey barrels. But it used to be not all that long ago that that was it yeah. for container gardening. And the only thing that people really put in containers pretty much was like geraniums. You know, they didn't do A spike all of and these. some vinca vine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, sp a spike. And, you know, it was so limited and it was so constrained. And I think it's just so amazing that we have been able to witness this transformation of container gardening from being this very, uh, you know, conventional, rather dull practice in the garden to this creative endeavor that you can use to to express your personality, to expand your garden space. You know, not just the the different plants and combinations that we use in containers nowadays, but the containers themselves. Oh, the containers. Unbelievable. You're right. And that's where we start. Uh, and of course, if you're going to do some container gardening, uh, take a look at the size of the containers. You want a big enough container to be able to provide some root mass and some soil. And, you know, if you look at proven winners, uh, you look at self-watering containers like the aqua pots, yeah. the selection of, of pots and containers today and the colors and styles. Wow. It, it's, it's such a big difference. And I think you make a great point about the uh, size of the container. So when people are asking me about like containers, you know, I'd say you want to put the majority of your money in pretty large containers. So to me, that means like 16 inches diameter or more. What, exactly. what do you consider a large no, container? No, I agree with that. As a matter of fact, on next week's show, we're going to talk about hanging baskets and I'll go off on hanging Ooh, baskets. I'm wait. so opinionated. I'm, I'm about hanging baskets like you are with wind chimes. I've got a strong <laughs> opinion. And I'm going to bring it, but we won't go there today. So, yes, at least 16 inches. Yeah, and, you know, I think it's useful. So a lot of times I buy containers in sets. You know, they'll be sold in a set, you know, th three of the same color, sort of small, medium, large. Yep. And I do like having that. It's, a, it's really nice and easy to arrange. But, of course, in that little container, you're probably just planting a single thing, just one plant. The medium, maybe one bigger plant, and then it's those larger ones where you really get to combine and use some of those tips that our guest Renee Claremont shared with us on last week's yeah. show about designing containers. Yeah, exactly. Of course, the soil's important. We talk about that often, a good potting mix, a good lightweight mix. But Stacy, a question that I've had through the years for a lot of people is you can, you can kind of go broke on potting mix. It's not cheap. It is not cheap. And I will say right now, I reuse my potting mix Thank every you. year. Because, whew, because <laughs> I do the same. And generally, I recommend to people, you know, at least keep half 
to three quarters of last year and then amend that soil. And of course, there are great four month slow release fertilizers yep. that you can use uh, amended maybe with a water soluble fertilizer and you'll be off to the races. Yeah, you know, potting soil is, is not only expensive, but it also is a natural resource. I mean, yes. most of our potting mixes are peat based. Peat is a natural resource. And so I think that we have an obligation and responsibility to treat potting soil, you know, not like a product that we just buy every single year, but as something that we invest in and continue to use. So I do what you what you might recommend. I um, store all my potting mix into in big uh, bins, storage bins in the winter. And then come spring, I take it out. I amend it with compost or composted manure, mix that in. And then I'm like multiplying my volume of potting mix, which means I get to have more containers. So Yay. it's win-win. Yay. <laughs> I like that. Well, I'm into containers too. So this week's Lim a Rick, I'm going to lay this on you here. I'm growing my personal Camelot, a haven of planters I've given great thought with many of every container, the end result is a no-brainer. My yard has gone to pot. <laughs> so there you go. I love it. Now, with containers, Stacy, we often talk about starting from the center, working our way out with thriller plants. And, you know, we know the various thrillers. Of course, I love cannas. I love cordylines as the thriller in the center. One thing that's fun to do is to put a vine in the center of a container. Put some stakes, like some bamboo stakes in the center. You could even plant seeds of vining plants, mm -hmm. like a hyacinth bean or whatever. And uh, vines take over the center as a thriller. Oh, that's such a good idea. Because, you know, sometimes you get tired of doing the same old, same old. Uh, my go-to thriller, uh, one that I always have to have every year, is Rock and Deep Purple Salvia. Oh, so, yeah. for you know, I, I probably a lot of our listeners, you know, are like us and they garden both in the ground and in containers. So I have my in-ground garden out there in the yard and I put containers on my porch and patios for a little bit of extra color. But I really focus my container plantings on attracting hummingbirds and butterflies because what could be better than attracting them to yeah. right where you sit? I agree. And so every choice that I make is based on color, of course, and colors of my containers. Um, but Rock and Deep Purple and Vermilion or Kufia are my must-haves every year because they attract so many hummingbirds, and I just adore the color and look of those plants. I love that. And for people keeping score at home, Stacy's talking about the Rockin' series of salvia, proven winners. Uh, I I agree with you. They are a kick in the plants. I love them. After the uh, thrillers, of course, we have the fillers, plants that tend to be rounded or mounded and make the container look full. And then we have some fun with the spillers placed uh, close to the edge of the container. So dichondra, silver falls, or potato vines. Uh, and of course, potato vines too. Today, there there's so many advancements. Uh, Tricolor, uh, chartreuse colors, uh, different uh, leaf shapes. Uh, they're fun to grow. They have come a long way since Margarita, the, that golden one, yeah. uh, busted onto the market several years ago. They have really become a standard. And that's another really cool thing that's happened with container plants is there's just been all of these new introductions that have just completely changed the way that we plant them. But I do want to go back briefly to fillers because, you know, thriller, that's easy. Spiller, that's easy. Filler is where yes. things get a, a little bit tricky. People are like, what is that? And, um, you know, I think a great example of a filler that a lot of people are familiar with is diamond frost euphorbia. Yes. So if, you know, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have grown it or at least seen it in hanging baskets and so forth. And that's a really great example because it's kind of poofy. Uh, you yeah, know, it's it rounded, blooms. but it also blooms all summer. it blooms all summer. It has a nice neutral color. It's white. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to work in with other plants and it's see-through. That's one thing I love about it is that it's not just like a big clump of plant. I mean, not that I have any, any problems with big clumps of plants. I love them, but it's, it's uh, light and airy so that when you have all these plants in, in combination in a container, uh, you can see through it to see everything and get that layered, uh, lush effect of all different colors and shapes and textures. You nailed it, Stacy. because uh, I agree. What you want is you want different leaf sizes, if, if that's the way I put it, in the container. Uh, you want that contrast, and that's what's going to make your container pop. Boy, uh, you can't beat something like coleus Oof. in a container. Well, unless you have deer, <laughs> and then you can. <laughs> but I <laughs> I was just shopping with my mom over uh, last weekend for our, our summer plants. We couldn't get everything because not everything was out, but she always plants coleus in her front yard, and I was just thinking how jealous I was of her that she gets to grow these big, beautiful, lush coleus because I have tried, and um, the deer have cl 
climbed up my front steps to chow them right down. Well, I grow them in my containers inside the compound. <laughs> the compound. So the deer don't eat them. Yeah. Yes. The, the lengths that we'll go to. <laughs> but, you know, I we we're talking about ca- kind of composing your container. And I actually compose my containers right in the garden center when I'm shopping, yeah. kind of on the cart saying, okay, you know, how are these going to look together? Um, I don't just buy a whole bunch of plants and then go home and figure it out. So I'm kind of working through it in my mind as I'm shopping. I love that. And uh, if you need some help with that as we go to break here, I want to recommend that Proven Winners is into recipes. We call them recipes. And if you're looking for ideas, you can go to provenwinners.com. And all you have to do is search Container Garden Recipes. Container Garden Recipes. And uh, you'll get a lot of ideas. You sure will. Coming up, Plants on Trial. That's next. Stacy's going to give us a good swift kick in the plants. Plants on Trial here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. This is Stacey Hervella. I'm here with Rick, and this is normally the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, talk about one of the 300-plus Proven Winners Color Choice shrubs, and you decide if you want to add it to your garden. But in the theme of today's show of container gardening, I wanted to kind of shift the segment a little bit and talk about growing shrubs in containers because we get so many questions about whether they people can grow shrubs in containers, how do they do this, what soil do they use, so, so many questions. And, you know, I would like to think that's because we have so many wonderful choices with Improving Winners Color Choice Shrubs. People say, whoa, I don't have any more room in my garden, or I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not making a new bed, but I really, really want this cool new shrub that you've got, so how about a container? And so I think it's really good to kind of give our listeners sort of a base understanding of yeah. what it takes to grow shrub and container so they can uh, do it at home. I think it's a great, great idea, Stacy. And I think part of the reason folks uh, want to do this is because they see it in public places or mm-hmm. out in front of a hotel and they want to do that at home. Yeah, and it, it is very simple. And, you know, I think the number one question that we get is, can I grow X in a container? You know, whatever plant they've encountered, that's what they, you know, or shrub rather, because we are focusing specifically on shrubs here. Can I grow X in a, in a container? And the answer to that is that pretty much you can grow any shrub in a container, uh, in theory. I'm going to give you a couple of caveats to that. But, you know, my response when people are surprised by that is to think of bonsai plants, And bonsai are trees, you know, real trees that would grow to, you know, very, very tall, 100 or more feet tall if left to their own devices in unlimited soil and space. But once you take that tree and you force it to grow in this very, very tiny container and you're pruning it and trimming the roots and, you know, really restricting its space it can grow and stay in scale. And and containers naturally have a similar effect on shrubs. Sure. Okay. But just by keeping it in that confined space, even something that would get quite tall is generally going to, you know, stay proportional and be a little bit smaller. Now that said, some plants that I don't recommend growing in containers are those that sucker uh, really vigorously. So something like I know we talked about Mr. Mustard Sorberia or Earl Fulspirea a few weeks ago, that would be one that I would not recommend um, because that it's it's like, have you ever tried to grow mint in a container? Oh, yeah. Everyone thinks like, oh, you know, mint, it's so rambunctious. I'm going to grow it in a container, and that will be great. But mint's like, mm I'm not going to be That's constrained right. by this container. Don't confine me. <laughs> Can't do it. And so it's like almost like with some of these plants, when you try to – um, change their inherent nature. They're just rebelling, uh, yeah. sort of like teenagers, I guess. And oh. uh, and they won't be. They won't. They won't have it. So it um, wasn't meant to be. It was not meant to be exactly. So um, sorberia, itea is another one that I wouldn't necessarily recommend in containers. Winterberry holly, um, staghorn sumac, and there's so many beautiful staghorn. Well, not so many, but there are some beautiful staghorn sumac varieties out on the market. But that will not be happy in a container. And if it's not happy in a container, then neither are you as the gardener. Well, Stacy, for me, I struggle with evergreens. And you'll see people in fall or towards Christmas plant evergreens in containers. And then by spring, you have this brown shell of 
what used to be a plant. Brown shell of sadness. Sadness. Yes, indeed you do. Ho, but ho, ho. <laughs> you answered your own question uh, <laughs> when you were asking that because the reason that so many people fail with planting evergreens is because they do it in fall and winter. Mm. Um, and it's not that you can't grow evergreens in containers. Yes, you absolutely have to you know, be more careful about watering. But when you plant something like that in fall and winter, what happens is it doesn't have a chance to get established no roots. That soil freezes. A lot of times this is happening at like restaurants and things like that. So people aren't like really caring for them. If that soil around that container freezes without, you know, reasonably good watering, yep. um, that is just absolutely going to dry up. Well, I would have to say I've had some success. And uh, what I have done is when I put the soil in the container, I leave an inch or two from the top of the pot so that I can mulch. Oh, yeah. Mulch will be hugely Does that helpful. Make sense? Yep, absolutely. Okay. And, you know, people don't think about mulching their containers, right, but exactly. it's always a good idea. If you have extra mulch, just sprinkle it right over the surface of your container around your plants. It will help so much okay. to keep that moisture in. But along the lines of evergreens, I would also say um, if you're considering evergreens in a container, you're probably best off with a needle leafed evergreen like a dwarf pine or or juniper or something like that, rather than a broadleaf sure. evergreen like a boxwood or a camellia or something like that. Those are going to, it's right there in the name, they're broadleaf. Right. So they are going to lose a lot of water out their leaf surface, and that's going to make it a lot harder for them to deal with this, this situation in the container of limited water. Okay, that makes sense. So there's my recommendation on that. Now what you can grow, some that I know do really well, and of course what we get the most questions about is hydrangeas, hydrangeas in containers. We have articles on our website about this, and generally speaking, I think hydrangeas do great in containers. I've seen bobo in containers. It looks gorgeous. Oh, bobo is a great choice. So bobo is a dwarf panicle hydrangea reaching just about three to five feet tall and wide. So especially when you're dealing with these more dwarf varieties, um, they're really, really suitable to, to staying in scale, you know, with that container. Let's dance hydrangeas now. I mean, these are the, these are uh, big leaf hydrangeas, the kinds with the purple or blue full, the flowers that everybody and their brother wants to grow. Um, and a lot of people can't or haven't had success, um, but they can do okay in containers. They are one you might want to move to a protected spot rather than just leave you know, exposed out in the middle of your yard or, okay. or something like that. Now, um, I do want to briefly address container size when it comes to shrubs, because this is another question that we get uh, a lot. And so basically what I recommend is that you match the container size close to the size of the shrub that you purchase. Okay. So if you buy a one gallon container, that, that container is about 10 inches. So you're buying the, the hydrangea or the plant in a one gallon that container is about 10 inches in diameter. So you're probably going to want to go with something that's about 12 to 14 inches diameter and a, approximately as tall. So you don't want to just have a huge container and a little tiny plant in the middle, not just from an aesthetic standpoint, but from a plant health standpoint too, because that just leaves a lot of soil to sit there and absorb moisture and you know allow for root rot because there's okay. just all that wet soil sitting around with no roots to take it up and no evaporative forces to take it away. Sure, that makes sense. Now, I have tried, uh, Stacy, growing shrubs in containers, but what I've resorted to is pulling them out of the ground in October and planting them directly into the soil next to the container and then replanting them again uh, the next spring. You know, I could understand why people don't want to do that. Well, I, I think it's a great idea. It's a great solution if you have the space, but not everyone has the, the space, right? has the ground space. And I think a lot of the people that we hear from who want to grow shrubs in containers, you know, they have a condo or very small space, you know, not enough room to, to allow for that. So it is possible. Now, a lot of times when you hear people talking about growing shrubs in containers, they say, choose a shrub that's two zones hardier than the zone that you live in. So if you live in zone six, like we do, you would only be planting shrubs that are hardy to USDA zone four. Um, that's okay advice. I don't think it's bad advice at all, but I don't think that it tells the whole story. And I also think it's very limiting because a lot of times yeah. <laughs> that's, that's cutting out a lot of plants. If you're in zone five, then you're basically limited to what? Potent <laughs> Practically, and, and maybe cornice, a couple of other things. Barberry? <laughs> oh, 
bite your tongue. Uh, but um, so it, it's okay advice. But again, it doesn't tell the whole story because what I have found, and I have, I was a rooftop gardener in New York City where everything was in containers and conditions, yeah. of course, were very extreme because we're way up on the top of buildings. But what I found more than anything, the key to success is not so much that hardiness, but uh, its ability to withstand periods of wet soil. Because what happens with a container when you have something in a container through the winter is that when it gets real cold, that container freezes solid. And so all that soil, you know, matrix is mm -hmm. completely frozen. And then when the temperatures start to get a little bit warmer in late winter and early spring, it starts to thaw. Yep. But of course, it's thawing from the outside in. So that deepest central core of the container remains a big frozen ice cube. And then at this point in the season, it's starting to rain. There's still some like wet snow happening. Yep. And so all that moisture is going in, but it can't drain out because the center is still frozen. So really, I think that's the key to success almost more so or indeed more so than hardiness is that ability to withstand that so I think that's an important consideration um, for people it's one reason why I think butterfly bush are not necessarily the best for containers unless you can put them sort of under an overhang or something like that to prevent that you know rainfall that you can't control yeah. from rotting the roots of course you still then need to monitor the moisture you know, by hand going out there and checking it. But um, I think that that really is what I have seen kill plants more so than cold. Plants are just like people. And with people, you know, you think about a March day or whatever, and it's cold and wet. There's nothing worse than having wet feet. Oh, don't you hate that? It just And, you know, my mom would send me to school with bread bags in my <laughs> boots just to avoid that. Yeah, that rut feet is no fun at any time of the year, but especially in March. Yeah. So we could go on and on about growing shrubs in containers, and we would love to, but we're out of time for the moment. So uh, I'm going to put everything that you need to know in our show notes at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. I'll link you to some additional articles that we have, and you'll see some pictures of shrubs in containers because we're going to take a break, and then we've got gardening questions, and it is garden question go time. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. One of the ways that we try to simplify gardening for you here on the Gardening Simplified Show is that we answer your garden questions, because of course, one of the most confusing things about gardening, if you're getting started or, you know, even if you've been doing it for years, plants can do weird things. You can find yourself in new situations that you don't know how to resolve. And uh, Rick and I have seen a lot. And we can put our heads together and try to help you. So I'm there all the time. You know, I, I say that I've been a professional horticulturist for some 20, 20 plus years now. And I swear plants get weirder to me every oh, year. For me, it's <laughs> like, where am I? How did I get here? And that's a wonderful thing because they never stop being fascinating <laughs> and wonderful. And it never, uh, gardening is just a, a lifelong pursuit. So if you have a garden question for us, you can write us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Or just go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com and click the contact form. You can write us a letter. You can even, uh, you can write us an email, I guess, not a letter. Uh, you can even attach a photo, a photo, which is very helpful in many cases because some people have very specific questions. So don't hesitate to reach out and Rick is going to see what's in the mailbag this week. Well, let's dip in here and take a look. Deb has a question for the Canna King. That's that you. would be me. <laughs> <laughs> Canna Conundrum. I like that. I bought a pot of cannas last fall, placed it in a dark room, but it wasn't cold enough, and they started to grow again in December. It's now April, and it's blooming. My question is, do canna rhizomes need a downtime, or can they just keep on growing? That's a great question, and I would mention that I dig mine up in fall and uh, put them away, and the reason I do that is... Uh, basically, that rhizome is a storage vessel. And in fall, as the days start to get shorter, I wait to cut back the cannas and dig them up. Because just like with other plants, you're translocating um, nutrients, uh, food into that rhizome or that root, and you want to give it plenty of time to do that. So do I feel that they need a resting period? Yeah. Could you grow a canna similar to how you would grow a house plant indoors? Sure, you could. But it's not going to be as robust, in my opinion, as it is if you were to follow that cycle of digging them up in November, putting them into storage, and then replanting. You know, it's, yeah, it's, cannas are, are funny because if you go to a warm climate, 
say like USDA zone nine or warmer, exactly. cannas are pretty much a, a year round plant. It's like a house plant. If they get a little frost, it will knock them back. They'll take a little rest and then they'll come back up once, you know, the days are longer and the temperatures are warmer. So it's kind of like they can go dormant if they need to, but they don't strictly have to. Now, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with your cannas, but I think they will be fine. Oh, I, mean, I, do too. I would definitely go ahead and plant them in a container, water them. They might benefit from a little bit of extra fertilizer since they have been expending a lot of energy from that storage rhizome uh, blooming in your basement <laughs> with, with hopefully someone to enjoy them. Um, but I think they'll be fine. And I would say, by all means, plant them outside in some good, rich potting mix, fertilize them, you know, every two weeks or so. And I think by this summer, you won't even know. And the next fall, uh, go ahead and let a frost knock them back is what a lot of people do, or just cut them back. Wait until like mid to late October, and then they should be fine. Yeah, I agree. I think you're going to be fine, Deb. And uh, right now, now that you're at this point, one thing you could consider doing, and I know it'll, you know, it'll hurt, but take a pruning shears and just clip those few blooms off right now, get it outside, and then let's, uh, let's get that plant off to the races. Right, which will save the plant the energy it would otherwise put into developing seed, which you don't want anyway. Terry's asking us, what is the range of temps appropriate for planting grass seed here in West Michigan, uh, soil temperatures of 55 to 60 degrees is, and that's usually when we see the forsythias in bloom. Wow, that, that really uh, sort of prompts a lot of garden activity when those forsythia exactly. are in bloom. You know, I think I don't know a whole, whole lot about grass, but what I do know is that it is also variety specific. So sure. if you've decided to, I know um, my husband and I brought, I forget which type it was, we bought a very drought tolerant grass because our yard is so sandy and sunny and it recommended a fall planting instead of a spring one so whatever grass seed you're buying it should come with instructions but overall you know grass seed as as any gardener who's had to contend with it in their beds can tell you it's kind of hard to get it from not growing (laughs) so there is an old adage grass grows best where you wish it wouldn't yes i have certainly found that that's the truth in the cracks of your driveway and your planting beds but it's all about soil temperature. So in spring, when we get to 55, 60 degrees, uh, that's when you're going to uh, that's when you're going to plant grass seed. And I agree with Stacy. The optimum time in the northern states to establish a lawn and plant grass seed, in my opinion, is August, September, when the soil's nice and warm, but the temperatures are going to start cooling down. We get regular rainfall. Uh, that's a great time to establish uh, seed. Not everybody carries a soil thermometer around in their vehicle like I do. Or multiple. Uh, Or multiple. (laughs) (laughs) Steve's writing to us, thanks for the great shows. I have two questions. Is it helpful to apply corn gluten to the lawn for weed control? And if so, when is the best time to apply it? I am building a wicking, not wicked, a (laughs) wicking raised bed garden for my vegetables. Do you have any advice or experience with these? The corn gluten, of course, is great for suppressing weed seed. It's not going to kill weeds, but what it's going to do is suppress weed seed. And what time of the year is that a problem for us in our lawns? Well, spring, think crabgrass. Yep. And then again in fall with winter annuals. So I recommend if you want to take the corn gluten approach, and i I believe it's a great choice because it's also a natural nitrogen source. Go ahead and put it down. And my recommendation would be to be using it in spring and fall. Well, you know, I have a joke as I'm walking through my garden in the summer. If it wasn't for crabgrass, I wouldn't have no grass at all. <laughs> so if I were to ever become a blues singer, that would be my first. That is a great blues <laughs> my song. My first hit. <laughs> You're going to climb the country charts here with that song. <laughs> that is great. Oh, but as for his question about the the wicking garden bed, so I had not heard of this, um, but I looked it up when I saw this question, and basically it's like taking it's like making a raised bed into a self watering container. So you have like your PVC pipe, you build it over a reservoir of some type. Okay. You've got your PVC pipe, so you can you know get the the water down in there. And so basically this is a raised bed that's built over that. Um, and people are familiar, I think, with self watering containers. They've right. become more and more popular over the 
coming years and or the, the most recent years. And I think um, I think it's a great idea. Um, I think it's very interesting. I saw a lot of pictures of this online, and it's nice because you don't see the reservoir. Just like with a self watering container, you're not like, Oop, well, there's a self watering container. You know, it's all hidden within. Um, and I would say there's two things, sort of two caveats that I give to people when they're talking about self watering containers. Number one, and a lot of instructions don't uh, actually factor this in or tell you, but until the plants are rooted in, the self-watering effect is meaningless. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen until there's root growth deeper down into the soil because the, the, the roots need to take up the water. So you need to actually water manually for probably the first four to six weeks after planting, whether that is a wicking bed or a self-watering container. And that's particularly true if you're growing from seed. Because, you know, the seed is just that little tiny seed with no roots. That water is not going to get all the way up to the surface of the wicking bed to actually get that seed to imbibe the water it needs to go on and germinate. So that means you're going to be hand watering. And you have to be very careful about that because, of course, any self-watering container is contained and it, you can it's easy to overwater sure. so you you could end up you know flooding it out so you have to be very careful about that well we're all looking for set it and forget it solutions with lots of things yes. right and set it and forget it can often get you into a lot of trouble <laughs> it can and along those lines uh, and i've heard uh, a couple of horror stories before um someone says oh you know what I, i'm going on vacation I'm going to ask my neighbor to water my plants. I said, oh, don't worry. They're self-watering containers. Uh, watering a self-watering container is not equally obvious to everybody, nor is it equally obvious from container to container. Sometimes it's really not clear where you actually put the water in. So if you're relying on someone else to help you refill those reservoirs and keep your plants growing well, make sure you give them a little tutorial before you just hand over the keys to the garden. That's why... Um I just wet my plants because this <laughs> just continues. People struggle with watering and pruning. Yeah. Watering and pruning. Well, watering is definitely the one people say, I would like to know exactly how much water Correct. and when, to, and we can't know. And it's if I were to simple. say that, and, and I've experienced that in the garden center, if I said, okay, well, hold the watering can, face east, elevate your left leg into the air, and poor progressive, they would follow the, because they're writing it down. And how often? Uh, once a week. Okay. You know, and it doesn't <laughs> work that way. We just don't have a set it or forget it uh, solution. And, you know, that's why we say gardening is both an art and a science. You got it. So if we can help you with the art or science part, don't hesitate to reach out at help at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just visit the website gardeningsimplifiedonair.com for the show notes and to ask your questions. We're going to take a little break, but when we come back, guess what? The Birdman is back. All right. So uh, please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show. It's time for branching news, not breaking news. And this week... Back by popular demand, or as an arborist would say, by popular demand, uh, the Birdman. He's going to swoop in to tweet us with some more bird talk. And uh, Birdman, thanks again for joining us here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Always a pleasure, Rick. Keep well, things lively. You betcha. Yeah, and speaking of lively, CNN uh, did a story this past week, which was fabulous. Parrots learning to call each other on video chat. They're using like an iPad or a phone, and they're call they select who they want to call, and then they just have this conversation, and they kind of uh, just have some fun together. It's amazing. Does the other bird answer? Yes, they do. <laughs> Even if they don't feel like talking? <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> Two can play that game. <laughs> the bill is in the mail. That's right. <laughs> Polly wants more than a cracker. I can tell you that. They want to FaceTime together. So anyhow, we'll put that link on our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. So Birdman, give us an update on the uh, the loons on the lake. How are they oh, doing? Our loons are just in, in the perfect spot. They're sitting on their raft. Uh, she went on the, her nest on the 25th. I watched her a couple days ago and she was rolling an egg over in the nest. I can look right out my window and in my spotting scope and watch her. Mm. And uh, she'll be on the nest for about 28 days. And then uh, off will come another one or two 
little loons. Um, by the way, since 1992, uh, we've had um, 28 chicks. Oh wow! Catch awesome on our on our lake. That's just and pledge and, and uh, you know so uh, a loon uh, their their life expectancy is twenty eight to thirty five years so they can replace themselves quite a few times. That's uh, amazing. The, and yeah, and but they're losing habitat so we have to be very careful with them and watch them closely and and beware of them. Yeah, I was watching a special on the Smithsonian Channel about the Great Lakes and the importance of the loons. What what an amazing bird and. Uh, yeah, the work that's being done to uh, to preserve the loons is uh, a very important work. Let's talk a minute about goldfinches. I love seeing goldfinches at my bird feeder, and it never ceases to amaze me, Birdman, how they uh, how they can kind of change color, and they're almost like the flowers. They bloom in spring. At least it feels that way. Well, they really do. They uh, they're Feathers change. The males, in particular, uh, they're kind of gray and gray, gray, yellow, and during the during the winter, in their little flock, in their little nomadic flock, and they come into your feeder. But now they come in and they've changed to a bright yellow and black, and uh, and they're chattering a lot more. They're up there in the trees, just making noise. But uh, they don't uh, they don't nest until the uh, uh, late summer. Oh, oh, really? I didn't realize that. No, I yeah, have. I have they, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, they wait until the uh, thistles uh, oh, uh, yes. are ripe, and then they use the thistle down uh, for their nests. Yeah, you're right. Uh, in August, uh, for example, when the globe thistle uh, have finished blooming, I will see globe thistle uh, covered in goldfinches. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. And you know, gathering bedding. I've seen their nests before, and they are just like the softest, comfiest little fluffy nest. Um, so how late in the season, and, and their young still have enough time to mature before conditions get really harsh? They do. It's usually August. Okay. And then, um, but when you start to see if you're familiar with what the little ones look like when they fly and when they speak, they don't speak a regular chatter like a uh, goldfinch does. It's a different kind of a sound. Mm. That means that fall is on its way. Oh, interesting. It's, that's about the time they, they leave, start to begin to turn is about when they're, uh, when they're, uh, just totally fledged and ready to, ready to meet the, meet the winter. Now, are there other birds that also nest that late in the season? I don't know of that. Uh, you could get a, a, a third nesting of bluebirds that would mm. be fairly late. Interesting. That happens pretty regularly because bluebirds uh, can nest two or three times, and that, that's really one reason that they're coming back so nicely. Oh. Mm. Well, and it's, uh, it's another good reason uh, if you have uh, some wild growth uh, around your property and you have some glo uh, globe thistle growing, maybe just let it grow and... Let the finches uh, enjoy it. So, Birdman, uh, I had to throw on our list today, kill deers. And I had to throw kill deers on the list because Adriana just loves kill deers. And uh, what, a, what a fascinating bird. It's, it's a plover. Uh, and so I guess one of, the, uh, one of the fascinations with the bird is um, how it lays its eggs and goes about doing that. They are absolutely fascinating. And you don't even know that you're coming on them when you're in their nesting territory because it's usually just a, a field or a rocky spot or an open open place, uh, a few gravel rocks, and their eggs are down in between looking at that. And you'll flush them off the nest, and then they'll, they'll look like they're wounded. They'll drag you away from where that nest is by flopping along and flapping their wings and calling and limping and... Uh, they're, they're drive you crazy. So <laughs> then you, then, uh, but if you move away from that and watch, they'll come back to where the nest is. But to figure out where that is is really tough because they those little speckled eggs really look like rocks. Yeah, they're so camouflaged, and you know, being in horticulture um, here uh, at 
our nursery, we get a ton of killdeers because we do have so many gravel spaces. And um, when I lived in New York, a friend of mine owned a nursery upstate and they had similar, you know, all the surfaces were gravel. And they also had a little long haired Jack Russell Terrier and she would <laughs> fall for the killdeers act Every single time, <laughs> never learned. year after year after year, that that killdeer would walk away with its fake broken wing, and she would just be following <laughs> it and following it, and it was it was so fun to watch uh, the two of them together. Um, but you know, I've seen killdeer really in any gravelly spot, and I do see them a lot here uh, in Grand Haven along the edges of our bayous and swamps. So kind of when they recede, when they get a little bit drier, I see them all the time just running all around that. Is that common to see them in those wetter areas? Well, just think about you've got a little gravelly spot. What a perfect place to hide your nest is in, the, in the, that, those pebbles. Yeah. Yeah. Camouflage. Have, have, you ever seen, have you ever seen the babies? Yes. They are so cute. It's like a ping pong ball on stilts. <laughs> a little fluffy ping pong ball. They just waddle around and chase, and uh, but they're they've got to be three feet or three inches tall. They look like they're three feet tall, but three inches tall in this little round spot on the top, chasing mom. Yeah, it's great. They're fascinating. I love plovers, and of course here uh, along the shoreline of uh, Lake Michigan, piping plovers uh, very important. A lot of important work being done trying to preserve that bird and uh, again their their penchant for uh, laying those eggs and camouflaging them on the ground and of course that's uh, predators foot traffic going to become uh, a problem but they they are continuing to survive and multiply so they're uh, and they're protecting those areas Rick uh, to keep some people out at least and uh, they're they're increasing the population. And it was it was nip and tuck there for a while whether they were going to have piping yeah, clovers exactly. anymore. Exactly. But it looks like they've saved them. But we have to keep watching them. Okay, Birdman, hummingbirds. Everybody's ready to. Have you put out your hummingbird feeder yet, I, Stacey? I did put out my hummingbird feeders because last year I saw my first one on April twenty fifth, mm. uh, and <laughs> who's counting? Um, and I have not seen any this year, but even though, and it's been very cold, so I don't think that's terribly surprising. But my fear, of course, is that if they are coming back, they're going to need energy more than ever because it has been so cold and so gray and so gloomy. So, uh, obviously, they've been working their way up from the south. Uh, Birdman here in the north, is it a good idea to put out the feeders now? It's a particularly good idea because it's cool and your uh, nectar is not likely to spoil particularly quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I do have two reports of Orioles being seen in this last week. And when the Orioles show up, so do the hummingbirds. So they're they're here, or they're about to be here, just it's momentarily. Uh, and to have your have your oranges out for the Orioles and uh, get the uh, hummingbird feeders out for the hummingbirds, and the Orioles will spot the hummingbird feeders too. So you're about to see a, a party of colors. I can't wait. You know, my neighbor put out, out oranges for the Orioles because she always gets them, uh, but the house finches are doing a number on her oranges oh. <laughs> in the meantime. <laughs> So they need a well, little they're kind vitamin of C. They're, yeah. they're, they aren't the worst, you know, but I'm I'm worried the Oriole's going to come back and be quite indignant when it finds that orange to be completely picked over. <laughs> well, they, they know how to compete, you know, yeah. and uh, maybe there'll be another orange one day. No, it's true. And we both my neighbor and I put out a lot of hummingbird feeders. So um, between the two of us and all the flowers and coverage and everything that we offer, I, I hope that we make a pretty nice welcome spot for them when they get back to Michigan, even if it does turn out to be as cold and crummy as it was these past couple weeks. I think we're going to move right into some nice weather right now, but uh, putting out uh, brightly colored perennials and annuals uh, and uh, shrubbery that uh, has good colored uh, flowering shrubbery, it's just, it's good for all of of the animals and birds, but particularly hummingbirds and the orioles. Here, here. And uh, the shrubbery and trees and other plants also, Birdman, are going to provide a little bit of protection for those robins who are hopping around on our lawns and in our garden beds. They're nesting, too, and we'll see those nests, uh, if you're observant, uh, right in the, uh, the crevices of the branches uh, here. And that's something I always look forward to in spring. 
look in the forsythia bushes. Mm-hmm. They love forsythias, like last yesterday or last week's program. And I'm a lover of forsythia, particularly when they go kind of gangly and wild. Yeah. And their branches touch the ground and they root again, and you've got more of them, and you make a hedge out of the things. There they you are, go. And that that type of uh, shrubbery is perfect for uh, all kinds of nesting birds. Yeah, birds really love that sort of uninterrupted wall of, you know, branches and leaves and coverage so that they can find a lot of hiding places. And it's great for them with so many natural predators like feral cats and that kind of thing, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And cats are a problem. But uh, if they can hide, away, then, then uh, birds have been quite successful here in southwest Michigan. Right. Well, you don't have to twist our arm to plant, to plant more shrubs and perennials and that kind of thing. <laughs> Well, Birdman, thanks so much for swooping in. We appreciate it. Uh, Of course, uh, I have found through the years that folks who love plants and flowers just naturally gravitate towards birds, too. They add to the color and sound of spring, and and we appreciate you very much sharing your your interest and your knowledge of birds. Well, you're always welcome. Uh, I always cheat a little bit. I've got three books that I use all the time. Like, you know, you use uh, Google, and I use uh, Don and Lillian Stokes nature guides. Isn't and this got bird bird behavior? I'll tell you everything you need to know is in those books. You've got your books. We've got our Google and the parrots have FaceTime and they're having fun. <laughs> too, so. Well, you know, well, squawk, squawk. <laughs> I uh, have started uh, over the past couple months using the Merlin bird ID app. And I don't know if you're a big phone user, but that has just been an absolute game changer for my birding and particularly the sound ID. Have you ever played around with that? Um, I just haven't had time to fool with it, to okay. tell you the truth. But I've seen, I've had uh, people that I've been with use it and to uh, help identifying the song mm-hmm. and then the song with the color and the habitat. It just it, it's a it's a quick learn to to what usually takes me a long time. Yeah, it's been absolutely amazing, and I love it. At first, I was so dubious about it. I thought, oh, there's no way that it's going to be able to identify these birds. But not only does it identify the birds, but it will also then highlight which one that it has, you know, identified that's singing at that particular moment. And so, you know, when you're talking about the goldfinches and the juvenile goldfinches having a different sound, I'm very eager, uh, well, not that I'm rushing summer or anything, but um, when, you know, that does happen later, Later this summer, I'm very eager to uh, to discover if I can pick out those juvenile calls versus the adult calls and songs um, when those when those babies are out and about because I get a ton of goldfinches in my garden. Well, the warblers are in, and now's the time to use that kind of an apparatus because warblers are terrible. Oh yeah, they're they know notoriously the different songs yep. and, the, and the colors and the things, and that that'll be a gold mine for you. Well, that is my plan right. for this weekend is uh, birding with my new binoculars and my Merlin sound ID. And along the lines Enjoy. of bird <laughs> vernacular, uh, is that app cheap? Oh, Rick, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and it's I highly cheap. recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> Birdman, thank you very much. Always fun to talk to you. We'll talk to you again. All right. Perfect, Rick. Thanks for the call. All right. Talk take care. soon. Well, Stacy, that was a tweet. Uh, always fun to talk to the Birdman, and uh, hopefully Adriana got her fill of killdeer talk. And if she didn't get the, her fill of killdeer talk, she'll get it when she is seeing the killdeers in her neighborhood tennis court this season. I love it. Have yourself a great week. Thanks, Stacy. Thanks, Adriana. And thanks to you for watching and listening to the Gardening Simplified Show. <laughs>